hello. I'm the Bad Cop 69 for Megaton Video. You'll notice that this video is actually being uploaded onto my Bad Cop 69 channel. You'll also notice that, uh, as I'm speaking to you now, that I've used the word Megaton Videos. Well, that's because this video was going to originally be my inaugural video to my secondary arts and entertainment channel, but unfortunately I realized that a academic presentation that will be as big as this will be, or at least a mostly academic, to be more precise than individuals like, say, the likes of, oh, I don't know, Movie Bob will be big enough to be able to be uploaded onto my Bad Cop 69 channel that you're watching on it now, but will not be able to be uploaded to the new channel as the newer time frame. Being able to upload big videos will not be ready at the time of the launch of this video. Now some could say, well, you could just simply sit on this video, but I, f I believe that striking while the iron is hot is probably the best way to go about this a presentation of this time, as I believe that this is something that, after tonight, won't be much of a talking topic. And I wanted to basically get this all out, get it all out on film, and present it to you, my audience, who have stuck with me through thick and thin, and to my new audience members who've recently become fans of my channel. Obviously, this intro that I am filming will be cut when it is able to be uploaded onto the new channel. And no, I will not long link you to the channel at this point in time because, once again, the channel's just not ready yet. But it will be ready quite shortly. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, permit me to somewhat restart my intro now that we're all on the same page so that when I cut this video again for the new channel, things will be perfectly clear. Hello everybody, the Bad Cop 69 here for Megaton Videos. And on today's installment, we're pulling out all the stops for an extra long video presentation that I'm going to entitle The Case Against Anita Sarkeesian. Now, I know on some levels, this is a topic that has been done to death. But I promise you, once we get into the third act of this video, you will not have seen coming what I have to say about Ms. Sarkeesian and company, and that you will understand fully. While the talk of progression and progression of roles and images in the gaming industry is not, I repeat, not a bad thing. It is, however, a bad thing when somebody calling themselves a feminist as well as uh, calling themselves a champion for young girls and young women everywhere, comes in and starts to become the face of feminism in video gaming. Now, I want to make very clear at the top of this video, I am not against Ms. Sarkeesian because she is a woman. I'm certainly not trying to support the misogynistic patriarchal status quo. I'm certainly not trying to be against her because of her claims that she is a feminist. And you'll understand why I put those words in quotes, or that word, excuse me, in quotes, uh, after the end of this presentation. It's not even because she dared to speak up which I thought were all very weak counterpoints to any kind of constructive criticism against Ms. Sarkeesian's positions on gaming. Except, wait, that's right. <laughs> when we get to the end of this video, you might actually start to understand just how big of a con this entire topic, and indeed her entire body of work, has been thus far. Because after a while, I started to realize through the research of others as well as my own research that I was extremely correct that Miss Sarkeesian is indeed putting on a con job and is conning people for money, I might add, something I will have no problem with uh, actually proving. But what I never ever was prepared for was the fact that I was right, but not for quite the reasons that I assumed that I was correct for. 
So, permit me this indulgence as I start Act 1 by actually going through and having some talks about just the pure academics of Miss Sarkeesian's work before I go into Act 2 and then eventually go into the big reveal of Act 3. Now, I'm not going to do timestamps, but down in the underbar you will notice uh, that Miss Sarkeesian's videos do have links uh, in the description bar. The reason for this being is, well, I do believe that she should be able to have her work speak for itself, and I would dislike it if individuals took this as something along the lines of not being intellectually honest myself, that I'm not allowing for her work to be shown so that people can check what I say versus what Anita herself might say on her Twitter account or on her Tumblr, because I think that it's extremely important that people understand that it's actually her detractors who have done way more research than she has in a move that would almost seem that what she is doing on some levels is to make her detractors do the research for her research that she herself was being paid for while individuals such as myself are not being paid for the presentations we do. In fact, this presentation right here is going to be an unpaid presentation. I did this research along with several, several other sources, some of whom I'm unfortunately unable to name, for free. And the sad part about it is, We've done a lot better job than Ms. Sarkeesian has done, but on some levels, I have to say, I think on some levels, this was on purpose. Take for instance, as part of a proof of this point, Ms. Sarkeesian's first video, Damsels in Distress Part 1, where she starts off, amongst other things, talking about Dinosaur Planet. Now, some would say that she did at least mention that there were two protagonists in the game. But the problem is, she does not talk about the second protagonist in the game. She goes on with the rest of the video after making the throwaway line that there were two protagonists in the game. The game was to star a 16-year-old hero named Crystal as one of two playable protagonists. She was tasked with traveling through time, fighting prehistoric monsters with her magical staff, and saving the world. By speaking about Crystal as if she were the predominant or only protagonist of the video game, the problem with this is it's not true. It's verifiably not true, in fact, for two reasons. Uh, the first problem is the trailer that she shows has clearly been cut from a free online trailer that's been on YouTube for years that was showing the development trailer for Dinosaur Planet. In the video, linked down below, you can s clearly see all the parts that involve Crystal, but what you don't see is all the parts that involve Saber. Saber was the male fox-like character, um, or I guess wolf-fox-like character, who was supposed to be in the game and was Crystal's brother. She looked an awful lot like Star Fox. Yes, there is that part, but this whole idea that Miyamoto joked that this would make a great Star Fox game and therefore on a joke from Miyamoto, they completely scrapped what would have been a better game for a lackluster game to prop up Star Fox by damseling Crystal. Here's the thing, though. And another reason why I think on some levels the flaws in Ms. Sarkeesian's presentation may actually be on purpose. One of the few and almost only sources that Ms. Sarkeesian herself has cited is in that video. And in that video, or in that link, excuse me, you can clearly see that Ms. Sarkeesian has not been honest at all about anything having to do with Dinosaur Planet or at least with only the most bare minimum of details about Crystal while omitting or lying by omitting details about Saber or the fact that Saber even exists or even showing any sort of pictures or screenshots of him. But it's not just that the link in her video of Damsels in Distress Part 1 actually shows that almost nothing of what Miss Sarkeesian said about Dinosaur Planet is true. It also reveals that there was a dinosaur princess. And here's the kicker. 
the dinosaur princess gets damseled. So all this talk that, that, that Star Fox Adventures is sexist because Dinosaur Planet was not going to be sexist, that Dinosaur Planet was going to buck the trend of damsels in distress and was going to empower young girls and women through video gaming, which that'll be another point we will get to at some point, that it was going to buck that trend is not actually true that it itself was going to be a damsel trope story. And whether you're using uh, Crystal or her brother Saber, you were still rescuing a damseled princess who is in distress. Oh wait, let me guess, because it's an anthropomorphic princess, it doesn't count, right? But from what I now know, which again will be presented in part three, it's hard for me to buck the idea that maybe Anita actually did this faux pas on purpose. Because you can't honestly put a link that completely deconstructs at least a third of your video, your academic presentation, in the link to your description bar and then act like, oops, I didn't know this disproved me. But there again, this, this is one of many examples that will put the academics of Anita's academic presentation into question. Not to mention the fact that she constantly tries to say that she's looking at things from a systemic, bigger picture perspective, and yet almost everything that she presents in the next, in this video, as well as the next two videos in the series. This demonstrates that if this is supposed to be academic, it fails on so many levels that if this were a presentation by a student, would get probably a D plus if the professor was being charitable, if not an out and out incomplete because of another point we're going to make here. Once again, linked down in the underbar is Anita's first video, Damsels in Distress Part 1, and we get to the part where she starts to explain what a damsel in distress actually is. The term damsel in distress is a translation of the French demoiselle en détresse. Demoiselle simply means young lady, while détresse means roughly anxiety or despair caused by a sense of abandonment, helplessness, or danger. One problem, though, almost word for word, as linked also down in the underbar, is a sentence about what a damsel in distress's origins are from Wikipedia. And that's not the only case of plagiarism with which Miss Anita has actually perpetrated, even going so far as to lift whole sections from the TV Tropes page on damsels in distress. In fact, TV Tropes seems to be a very popular source for a lot of Anita's work, though it's, of course, unaccredited links to her work, even when she actually says things word for word from said pages, or even when she talks about pages on TV tropes that no longer exist, such as the woman in the fridge page, which as more astute uh, individuals, link will be down in the underbar under the uh, academic section, that the, the whole concept of the damsel, or the woman in the refrigerator uh, trope doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Much like the Bactyl test doesn't hold up to scrutiny either. But again, that's another topic for another time should I ever choose to speak about Miss Sarkeesian's other work, which is uh, from her original Feminist Frequency show. Plagiarism is not allowed on a college paper. I may not have written a lot of college papers in my academic career as a movie, film, television, and radio student at a local college in the area, but I have written a few of them and I understand that things such as plagiarism, not only is it not allowed, it is not tolerated and can get your paper an incomplete and can really hurt you. But that's another part that really is a problem with this series. There's no major bibliography. There are very rarely, if any, actual cited sources for her materials, and when not citing them, she'll verbally cite them by quoting certain individuals whose quotes she finds to be neat. Which is another major issue, because if you're plagiarizing, you're not writing out the material as you understand it. You're not putting it into your own words. You're not writing it so much as you're just lifting other people's works. Which seems to be, again, an ongoing theme with her series, where her critics are doing far more far-reaching research than she herself is doing in her 
academic presentation that she feels should be shown in schools, and I can't imagine outside of a possible gender studies course that any professor worth their salt would take any of her series as presented thus far as being something that is worthy of presenting in an academic institution, because it fails on so many levels to meet academic requirements. Funny that, since you've got individuals like Movie Bob, who can't wait to call her presentation well-researched, well-put-together, and academic. Oh, but we'll get to Movie Bob in and of himself as one of her major supporters when we get to the problems of game journalism's support for Anita Sarkeesian and why it is so unnecessary and why I feel uh, looking at things as objectively as possible that this sort of phenomena actually exists. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We move right into Damsels in Distress Part 2. In this video, Anita actually pulls a John Fogarty for anybody who remembers the trial where John Fogarty was sued by a record company for plagiarizing himself. I've started to get a sense of deja vu while watching her video because she's almost lifted, again, nearly word for word, the woman in the refrigerator trope talk she had in her free video series on her channel, Feminist Frequency. Writers are using the women in refrigerators trope to literally trade a female character's life for the benefit of a male character's story arc. It's saddening to see how flippantly and trivially violence against women is treated in comic book pages, even with the most powerful of female superheroes, especially when violence against women in the real world are at epidemic levels. This trading of female characters' lives for something meant to resemble male character development is of course part of a long media tradition. But the gruesome death of women for shock value is especially prevalent in modern gaming. This again presents the problem of she herself stated in her Kickstarter thank you video that the extra money, the money above and beyond the $6,000 that she earned, would go to a more far-reaching uh, scope of research that it would uh, improve the production qualities, it would improve the scope of the research, it would even go to buying even more video games so that she could more thoroughly prove her points to us, the audience. An audience not unlike myself who was skeptical but willing to be shown. If she could prove her case beyond a shadow of a doubt, which she fails again on so many levels to do so, which again might actually be on purpose, you get to this, this point, you get to this sense that Miss Anita herself is just not even trying anymore. Let us not forget that she doesn't allow for comments on her video, and actually, once we get to the end of this video, I think it's very clear why that is. But again, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but I just want to shout all this information I've found through sources, some of which I unfortunately cannot reveal, <laughs> of what I know, because... <laughs> It's so laughably obvious when you actually start to think about it when you get to the end of this video. So she quite literally plagiarizes herself. Again, links to part two of her video series will be down in the underbar, as well as a link to her free episodes that she didn't ask for money for about the woman in the refrigerator trope. So she's recycled material that wasn't even correct to begin with from her original series, which again, this does not work on an academic level. It's academically dishonest. And so to call her presentation actually academic is laughable at best and an insult to academia at worst, because it's not in any way, shape, or form true. Rather than using that extra money, since she obviously didn't spend it on the video games, which again we will get to, since she obviously hasn't been spending it on the research, which again makes me have to ask where did the money go? We have no transparency, and apparently we have no right to transparency, depending on who you talk to, which means we'll probably never know what actually happened to the money unless, after a presentation like what will be presented in this video tonight, she actually comes clean. And I would hope she would, because what she's doing is disgusting. For all her talk about how video games are harmful and they, they cultivate, how they directly influence misogynistic behavior in men, but never 
never mind women who, who exhibit misogynistic behavior by a radical feminist or pseudo-feminist standpoint. You know, never mind any of that. It's all about how this stuff influences, cultivates men, how it directly influences men, and then she tries to get a, do a get-out-of-jail or get-out-of-intellectual-honesty or integrity card by trying to pull out of that nosedive at the very end of her video, invalidating the very first half of her video. I mean, seriously? Are you serious here? She makes claims that are unsubstantiated, such as the game Spelunky, that if a woman could be so easily replaced by a dog that that's insultative. Never mind that the guy in that very game could also be replaced by a dog. Does not address that point, just sort of skates by that for part three, but again, we'll get into part three here. Uh, and never mind that the guy being a hunky Chippendales dancer type, Blonde hair, not blue-eyed, but I would assume if the graphics allowed for such things, he'd be blue-eyed. Muscular, wearing the big old bow tie, wearing the, the speedo with the bulge. Oh, that's not a stereotype of men, and not, e and not a negative stereotype of men. It's not like, at times, guys in society aren't also expected to, to be buff and to be certain qualifications to be considered a hunk or a beefcake. But again, this isn't to throw mud on some of the pseudo-feminist or radical feminist uh, saber-rattling that is permeated throughout her video and does more harm towards the cause of feminism than good. It's that all of this somehow only ever affects men negatively and only ever affects women by proxy through stereotyping negatively. It's like when anti-porn feminists say that a woman's shaven vagina looks prepubescent, and therefore, if you, as a, as a grown adult, if you prefer a, a shaven adult vagina, that you are a closeted pedophile. But never mind the men who shave their genitalia to look what, by their logic, would look as like a prepubescent male. Oh no, that doesn't count. It only works with women, and the effects of that shaven genitalia only affect men and male sake psychology. What? No, I'm sorry, this does not work. This doesn't work even a little bit. But I digress. So she, for the second video, she recycles her own material, that material that was supposed to be paid for. And when talking about the money, she could be hiring somebody, if she's not buying, using the money for the games, if she's not using it for research and research staff, which is extremely, extremely clear, especially towards the end of this video, she could have bought and paid for a moderator to erase any and all troll comments on her page and allow for open and honest dialogue. The very thing that she has said from day one she wanted for this series. The very thing that she has not done from day one using this series. But worst of all, and this is where I need to go off the rails of academia for a slight second and actually start to talk about a big part of why I really took umbrage with, and I think rightfully so, with her second video. In the second video, she tries to conflate that real-life violence against women not only cultivates but encourages men to beat their wives or girlfriends. Games don't exist in a vacuum, and therefore can't be divorced from the larger cultural context of the real world. It's especially troubling in light of the serious, real-life epidemic of violence against women facing the female population on this planet. Every nine seconds, a woman is assaulted or beaten in the United States. And on average, more than three women are murdered by their boyfriends, husbands, or ex-partners every single day. Research consistently shows that people of all genders tend to buy into the myth that women are the ones to blame for the violence men perpetrate against them. In the same vein, abusive men consistently state that their female targets deserved it, wanted it, or were asking for it. Now, I'm not ashamed to admit this, at least not anymore, as social attitudes are slightly changing, but I would emphasize the word slightly. I am a five-year survivor of domestic abuse from a woman abusing me, the man. I have survived 
two attempts on my life by this woman. For her to say, without even beginning to substantiate, that violence against women in games cultivates or encourages or, or gives misogynistic men, who are only made more misogynistic by these video games, the go-ahead to beat their girlfriend or wives is an insult to not only just the talk about domestic violence, but is an insult to domestic violence survivors. The fact that this didn't sink her presentation or her series dead in its tracks still mystifies me because I felt like sh I felt violated in a way by her assertions, her assumptions that she never ever even tries to actually make the connection with. She throws out statistics of violence against women by men. She does not even begin to try to present the counter-argument that is to be made. When tallied up in most countries, violence against the opposite sex was nearly identical. Women are abusing men just as much as men are abusing women. And yet we've got more women's shelters than we do men's shelters. Oh, but no, these, these video games, they're keeping women folk down, aren't they? They're, they're hurting women in the most deepest ways possible by, by telling them that they should be submissive and that for guys, if a woman becomes hysterical, you know, if a woman acts up and won't make you a damn sandwich, that your only recourse is to smack a hoe. What she was doing was basically a complete dishonesty. She was trying to conflate that violence of women in video games somehow equals to real-life violence of women in the world by quoting statistics and talking about, without actually having a positive message like where women can go to talk about their domestic abuse that's being visited upon them. And no, I'm not going to say that men should have that too in this video. I'm just saying. She could have used this platform for something extremely positive. Instead, this was video games make you into a wife beater. Are you serious? I'm surprised she didn't blame video games for cancer. I'm surprised she didn't blame video games for AIDS. I'm surprised she didn't blame video games for global warming. Oh wait, but that's right. Those things would have to involve a way in which you could spin it to where women are worse off than the men and ergo video games are bad. But I, I on the other hand, will be linking down below to places that men and women can go if they are being victims of domestic abuse and violence. I'm going to do you the solid that Anita Sarkeesian, if she was truly about the rights and the help and the health of women, that she would be doing. Because the way she's putting it now is disgusting. And this video only further cemented the problems with the first video, meaning that the only person who was actually doing any kind of subject, uh, turning women into objects and objectification of women was Anita herself. And when Movie Bob goes in and starts talking about how, oh, but, but Anita never actually called me a moto sexist, which again, link to her videos down below. I'm not going to link you to Bob's video, though. He can go screw himself for all I care. Because he has been debunked and debunking videos about him that are a lot better researched and put together than my own are down in the underbar. But here's the thing. Down below is a link to a conference in which Miyamoto spoke about how he creates games. Miyamoto has, and I quote, a wife-o-meter. Meaning, Miyamoto runs his games by his wife. And is if his wife does not approve of the game, if his wife finds umbrage with or issues with the game, then Miyamoto does not release it. Does this sound like a rampant misogynist to you? A man whose career is quite literally hinges on the whims of his wife? Oh, let me guess, his wife doesn't count because if 
if she's approving these clearly misogynistic games, these clearly rape male power fantasy video games, you know, Mario and Link, then she must be what pseudo-feminists call a... <clears throat> wait for it, wait for it. A chauvinistic woman. Now you may be asking me, bad cop. You're throwing out this term and I have no frame of reference for it. Well, okay, fair is fair. I'm going to cite more sources down in the underbar. I'm going to put links to uh, what pseudo-feminists title as a chauvinistic woman. Chauvinistic women are the problem to a lot of radical feministic ideals and a lot of anti-porn ideals and a lot of pseudo-feminist ideals. A chauvinistic woman, to put it in the most laymanist of terms, is a woman who has a sexuality that is very indicative of a man. A woman who likes sex, who likes sex with possibly many different individuals. A woman who willingly goes into the sex industry. A woman who's willingly a prostitute. A woman who's willingly a porn star because, oh yeah, nobody ever, ever enjoys being a porn star. Nobody ever, ever, no woman ever, ever enjoys having sexual relations or having sexual relations on film. It just does not happen. It's the mythological beast, just like the unicorns and the Loch Ness Monster. That there is no such thing as the happy hooker and that it's all an invention of the porn industry to keep the sheep asleep. God, why do they sound like conspiracy theories? It's because they're about as credible as conspiracy theories can be. But the point of me bringing up the chauvinistic woman is this is how pseudo-feminists discredit women who disagree with them. Oh, but I like porn too, says little, uh, says Susie. I like anal fisting. I like this. I like that. You know, it gets me off. I like seeing girl on girl. I don't find that degrading at all. It's a turn on for me. I like to masturbate, says Susie again. I like these video games because I like the boob physics. Yes, there are women who do say this. I like the same characters that my husband like. I find these characters sexually appealing. You know what the response by the pseudo-feminist tends to be then? Oh, you poor patriarchal brainwashed little girl. Someday you'll grow up and you'll realize that your entire life has been a lie, that your sexuality isn't your own. You've been brainwashed by the patriarchy to believe that you actually are sexually attracted to this or you find these characters to be empowering to your life, that these characters serve any purpose other than eye candy for men and oppression and sexualization for women. It's basically their way of saying, sit down, shut up, your voice as a woman doesn't count. Does this at all sound like an ideology that is about the rights of all women? About the rights, opinions, and the needs of, every, of women and girls everywhere? I'm asking you seriously, does any of this make even the slightest bit of sense to any of you as far as an ideology? Again, talking about some radical feminism and pseudo-feminism. Does this sound at all like an ideology that works, that really cares about women of all walks of life and cares about their rights in any and all situations in which they choose to find themselves in, that has approval of all types of lifestyles? Now, yes, being in porn or being a sex worker can be dangerous, there can be health issues, but the thing is, pseudo-feminists want to tell you that the chauvinistic woman who's in porn is there because she's She's either a drug addict and the industry is feeding her addiction, or she was trafficked. Or somehow she had a gun put to her head off screen because you, ha you, can, you can only be in porn because you're forced. There's no such thing as sexual self-esteem. There's no such thing as healthy sexual self-esteem. That unless you are willing to basically be a prude on some levels, that your opinion as a woman does not count, that you must be excluded from the talk because we don't agree with you. Does that sound like how progression, social or otherwise, is ultimately achieved by saying, we don't like your lifestyle, or we don't like 
how your sexuality is, so we're going to exclude you from the group talk because we don't want to deal with, or we don't want to deal with on an intellectual or academic level, what you represent. No. So, so they don't care that there are women who love video games as they are and do not feel devalued, degraded, or depowered. Can you see now why I talk about how Anita tends to be the one doing the objectification of people like Princess Peach? Princess Peach being a monarch, being somebody of power, that her being removed from her current position of freedom makes all the difference in the world, and that the laws, the, the governing bodies of everything hinges upon this person. But no, to Anita, she is a ball. She is a goal to be met or a prize to be won, like a MacGuffin. You know, she could be anything. She could be a rock. She could be a dog. She could be um, a magical bed sheet. And it wouldn't matter. You would lose nothing with that. Are you joking me here? Are, are you seriously joking me here? This is an academic, this is what, f what, what passes as an academic presentation. Nobody outside of Movie Bob would that actually fly with, but Movie Bob's an idiot. Let's just leave it at that. Finally, ending Act 1 here, I want to briefly speak about the problems of Part 3, which was the Dude in Distress video, in which she does things where she highlights where fellow gamers and programmers and even a father-daughter team have reprogrammed video games to swap the genders out, saying, these are really great, only to then say that simply swapping out the genders isn't the answer. Basically throwing everybody who's done these ROM hacks under the bus, including somebody who I knew, a friend of a friend, who's no longer my friend anymore because of Anita. This friend who worked with me with a media channel that I just no longer work with because I just didn't have the time to get my, my programs in order. Programs like what you're seeing right now. She knew the girlfriend of the boyfriend who reprogrammed the original Legend of Zelda so that you could play as Zelda herself. My ex-friend insisted that the girl was not acting simply because she felt empowered by Anita Sarkeesian's presentation. Yet when I went to the blog of the individual who, of the girlfriend of the boyfriend who reprogrammed the game, she spoke at length about how she was actually inspired by Anita Sarkeesian. But by the time I had this information already, my friend, who was their friend as well, had left the friendship all because I spoke out against Anita Sarkeesian and called a spade a spade. I know on some levels I should be thanking Miss Sarkeesian because if a friend is willing to leave the friendship simply because of that, then there was, there was not a very good friendship there to begin with, but this still shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't be losing friends because I dare to take a more critical look at this topic and say, yeah, the gaming industry is sexist. There's no, there's no arguing against that. But the problem is when proving exactly how that hurts women and men since we're both participants in gaming. Say what you will about the differences of men and women and how women's brains can sometimes work in men's. If video games make men rape, if video games make men commit domestic abuse, and we have evidence, ample evidence, that women commit rape, that women commit domestic abuse, then we have to also acknowledge that if, if you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that video games alter one's behavior, which unfortunately the science is not with you, trust me, we're still trying to make some sort of really dumb um, proclamation that Video games, uh, violence in video games make violent people, and we cannot prove it. We can't even improve the implications that it can. So if violence in video games can't make us violent people, at least those of us who aren't prone to violence in the first place, 
then video games are not going to make men misogynistic. But if it if they were, then we have to agree also that these games make women uh, chauvinistic. If I were to say that chauvinism and women is an actual thing. Again, it's pseudo-feminism. It's not something that's real or tangible or something that actually works in the confines of anything even slightly academic. Lastly, the other issue is that Anita is very passive-aggressive. When her detractors did more research than her and actually deconstructed her talking points, what does she do? In her second video, she takes a passive-aggressive stab at Thunderfoot's uh, video showing the lie by omission that Anita Sarkeesian didn't show in her first video when it came to the game Double Dragon Neon, the sort of 3D remake. And while we're at it, just a little sidebar here. Her talking about how, oh, these bad guys were punching Billy or whoever's girlfriend in the solar plexus and is constantly carting her off. For instance, she describes Double Dragon Neon like this. Most recently, Double Dragon Neon in 2012 reintroduced new gamers to this regressive crap yet again, this time in full HD. Without mentioning that the game Double Dragon Neon ends like this. One day to antagonize you, Billy and Jimmy! Oh, right in the balls. <laughs> Which I kid you not, she then goes on to describe like this. The pattern of presenting women as fundamentally weak, ineffective, or ultimately incapable has larger ramifications beyond the characters themselves. Occasionally they may be allowed to offer the hero a last minute helping hand, or to kick the bad guy while he's down, but these moments are largely symbolic and typically only happen after the core adventure is over or the danger has passed. This is just like the really, really brain-dead discussion we had about the almost rape scene in Tomb Raider. Does nobody, does nobody at all understand how criminal minds work? It's like we want criminals in our, and bad guys in our video games, but we want them to adhere to a code of conduct and morality that we find to be okay. Here's a little news flash, people. Bad, violent criminals hit women. They have no problem with this. They have no moral quandaries with this. This doesn't bother them, okay? Some of them also rape. You got nowhere to run, Skull McGannon. Now where's Marion? Oh, where are my manners? I haven't introduced you to the new and improved Marion. I call her Evil Marion. I'm bad. I'm finally free. Ugh, you don't want to know what I've just been through. But he's gone now. I'll use the power of love to send you after him. Wicked! Oh, and, uh, I'm pretty sure human bodies can't survive this transition, so, uh... What? Uh, it'll be fine. Just go! You! You've taken my pride! You scrapped my rocket dojo, laid waste to my laboratory, broke my televisions, and murdered countless Williamses. All I wanted was a date. This and now. And if you can't understand that these bad people are bad people, then you have no idea about human nature and storytelling and in this case, I'm sorry, you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't have a pony in this race. But this concludes section one. Just sort of taking a general overview of some of the most egregious things that Anita did throughout her first three videos in this paid series. 
Part two is going to be talking a bit about the money uh, and her individuals who uphold her even after stuff like this is uh, is performed. And then we'll be going into Act three: the big the ruse revealed. Now before we leave part act one of our little play here, I have decided that uh, what would probably be the most helpful when it comes to speaking about this subject is the fact that there are critics who go after the critics of Anita Sarkeesian by simply saying, instead of me addressing your talking points, I'm going to make the point that you haven't talked about what sexism is. You've talked past sexism, but you haven't talked about what sexism is, what it's about. And that's actually a very fair criticism, although it doesn't excuse the very well thought out or very well researched talking points that individuals have made against Anita. So in an effort to actually be productive, in an effort to actually be objective, I'm actually going to spend a part of Act 1 actually talking about that very subject. In black and white dictionary terms, no subjectivity, only objectivity. Something that I could easily say is something that uh, Ms. Anita herself lacks, which is another issue I have with her work. But this also illustrates the problem with Anita's work as a whole. 
Did anybody ever actually stop to think that maybe the reasons why her critics are talking past sexism and not about sexism is because, one, Anita's work isn't all really about actual sexism, or at least it touches on it, but then it goes off the rails of objectivity into subjectivity. And two, because of this point, we aren't talking about sexism because we're stuck, instead of sitting down and having a productive, honest, open discussion about sexism, about this topic, we're instead stuck, bogged down, in trying to correct Ms. Anita Sarkeesian's in, factually incorrect information. And by factually incorrect, I mean by an objective, not a subjective margin. This would mean that as said, and as will be illustrated with the rest of this presentation of Act 1, that at best, Anita is what I said she was, a distraction. That instead of meaningful dialogue, instead of a progression on the field of anything that is even remotely sexist, we're stuck. We're stuck trying to fix the goalposts that Miss Anita moves, to fill in the holes due to lie by omission by Miss Sarkeesian, as she demonstrated in Act 1 and continue to illustrate throughout the entire three acts that she has done so far. That we are stuck trying to keep things objective instead of divulging into simply subjective platitudes that help, by the way, nobody. Men, women, young girls, nobody. This is from the Marin Webster's website, a very well-known dictionary, just so that people know I'm going to a reputable dictionary online, and not just picking a dictionary out of the hat that might somehow support what I'm talking about. There is generally two definitions. One, prejudice or discrimination based on sex, especially discrimination against women. Now, others who have shown this definition to say that that is a bit of a sexist definition in and of itself, and I do kind of agree. It's as if to say that sexism mostly or only exists against women, that it never happens against men. No, David Beckham's never sexually objectified Two men being together is never sexually objectified by women. No, 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 that's only the boys and the men who are doing this. But I mostly don't have a problem with that definition. Two, behavior, conditions, or attitudes that foster stereotypes of social roles based on sex. Meaning sexual uh, makeup as a, a person, physicality, not uh, based off of two people having sexual intercourse. Now that we have a very cut-and-dry objective, though some people would disagree with me on that, but that's fine, objective definition of what sexism is, the next step is to then talk about sexism, and since we're talking about the gaming industry in this case, as well as media at large, that's where we're going to take things. Because the problem is we go from this objective definition of sexism into the subjective realm of sexism exists to encourage men, women, but mostly men, of course. It encourages and fosters the ideas of that women are the weaker sex, that women are only here to inspire us, talking about Anita's talk to the men in the audience about the manic pixie girl trope. Women are only breasts and buttockses and sometimes vaginas, depending or, or a pair of legs, or maybe a long hairstyle, depending on what your particular eye-catching thing might be about. And when that cannot be proven to be true, because again, nowhere in Anita's series does she actually demonstrate or try to quantify the idea that gaming males are much more sexist, are much more misogynistically leaning than, say, the, the average non-gamer on the street. That would be a start, but no, no. See, this is where other media comes in, because then here's where the goalpost gets moved further. It's not the games that are the problem, it's everything we see around us. Because everything we see around us is somehow geared and engineered towards you know, the promotion of male sexuality only exclusively on some levels, and therefore it helps to not just foster 
misogynistic behaviors making getting such data nearly impossible, but it also desensitizes us to sexism, whether we're men or women. Or this is what Rebecca Watson had called in her little topic about women in conferences, that there are two kinds of women in conferences, women who are sexually harassed and women who are sexually harassed but aren't attuned to it. So even if you have a positive talk about never getting unwelcome groping at, say, an atheist conference, never getting sexual advances at an atheist conference, or at least ones that you didn't yourself warrant, that never being raped or attempted to be raped at a conference, it's not that you weren't, it's that you weren't attuned to it, that you were desensitized to it. That presents a very subjective view of media. I say this because we have been sitting here for hours on end trying to prove at times that media either fosters, encourages, or desensitizes us to violence. Yes, I'm going there. In fact, down below is a link to many decades worth of studies that we have done over and over and over and over and over again to try to prove that violent media begets violent people. And when we can't prove that, we try to go to the next best thing and say that, oh, well, it doesn't actually make your average person violent. No, no. What this violent media does is it desensitizes you to violence so that you if somebody is being brutalized on the street, instead of it being something of a symptom of the bystander effect, instead of it being something symptomatic of diffused responsibility, no, no, it's that you don't want to jump in because you can't perceive that as violence. That you have lost your ability to act or react to violence, and that's the true danger of video games and violence. One problem, though, they can't prove this. And the fact that now we're, we're trying to have the same exact conversation, only replace the word violence with sexism, I find to be appalling. Because once again, the burden of proof is on the one making the claim that this sexist media, in any way, shape, or form, fosters or desensitizes men and women to sexism, to where men have no issues with being sexist, as well as men have no issues with watching other men being sexist towards women because we're desensitized to it, we're not appalled by it anymore. And that women, women, are somehow also just completely desensitized to this sexism, that it just never, that it's happening to them, but they, they won't see it as being sexism, and that in and of itself will continue to foster the behavior. The problem with this is you have no scientific backing. If you could prove that, then you could easily help these senators at times. You could easily help these mouthpieces against me violent media and sexually charged media by proving that there is a direct link between desensitization of sexist behaviors, uh, desex desensitization of sexism, thanks to the media, thanks to advertisements, thanks to toys, thanks to video games. Because if you could do that, then you could easily use that research to further foster this ludicrous idea that media may rewires our brain, that media changes us fundamentally and can create a desensitized or more violent individual where none existed originally. And that games, by extension, with all these, these portrayals of violence against women, never mind the violence against men, Never mind the violence against animals, no, 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 just, it's all about the violence against the women. That that, that that teaches us men that it's okay to hit women. That when they get out of line, that it's okay for us to lay the smack down to get our women to come back to their senses, as Anita said as much in part two of her Tropes vs. Women in Gaming video. Again, you know where to find the link by now. 
the burden of proof then comes on to you, though, that you have to prove this desensitization. Because if that's all you have nowadays, because everything else that you've had, that media degrades women, it makes them feel subservient to men, and it makes men feel bold and, and empowered to be, sub, to be dom, dom, dominant to the point of violence against women, you have to prove this. Psychology especially does not support your assertions. Now, it is true that it is not nature versus nurture when it comes to the life and feelings of individuals and children who grow up to be adults. It is both. Some things you're born with. But take, for example, people who have psychopathic traits. Now, when I say the word psychopathic, what do you oftentimes think of? Do you think of somebody stabbing somebody in the shower? Yes. And on some levels, you wouldn't be completely out of place thinking so. The problem is, objective reality does not hold true to people being born. Psychopaths will become people who are incapable of empathy, and that's not even getting into the empathy switch stuff that we've recently found when it comes to psychopaths. It doesn't mean that uh, you know, they'll grow up to have no empathy, they'll grow up to be psycho killers, they'll hunt and stalk prey like they were animals because to them all the world is animals. They are the only human left and they have every right to do with people as they please. There are researchers in fact that cracked a lot of the genome and, and some of the, the traits of psychopaths who themselves actually have the exact same genetic traits and the exact same makeup. But why is it that Bob in the lab is not a psychopathic killer and Jerry down the lane uh, can't stop skinning women and making furniture out of them? Because there is the upbringing. Because there is the immediate influence of your parents. There's the immediate influence of your schools, of your, of your, maybe your churches in some cases. And all of these things come together and are more, much more of a cohesive force towards behaviors, towards uh, support for abhorrent behaviors or lack thereof if they're doing it in private, not seeking the approval of others because they've now distanced themselves from humanity. A psychopath may be born, but it takes like a domineering mother to make one who is more violent towards a woman. It might take a domineering father to make one more, more have more violent tendencies towards men. Here is where you have the major crux of what is going to uh, influence a person's behavior but more importantly, what's going to influence what people prefer in, say, control groups, in, in, in test groups, uh, focus groups, when it comes to things like advertising, when it comes to things like video games. And this is what bogs me the most about this topic. Now, let me make this very clear. Am I afraid to admit that there's sexism in the gaming industry? Obviously, I have not. Am I afraid to admit that there's sexism in advertising? I am. But I'm also not afraid to admit it's on both sides. For every thing that's marketed towards men in a way that can be stereotypical, in a way that can be degrading, there's stuff that advertises for women almost just as much. And the thing that Anita wants you to forget is the numbers. When she says stuff like, this is a male-dominated um, field. This is a male-dominated kind of pastime, of hobby. She's ignoring the 40, almost 50% of gaming audiences now are women. So to say right now that this advertising that has women, by and large, loving Metroid, loving Link, loving Mario, two of which are considered major contenders for being sexist tropes and, and degrading to women and, and depowering to women. You have women who write these long blog posts about, in detail, about how Zelda actually inspired them at low points in their life to keep on moving and turn them into stronger, bolder females. But it's not just that. It's that you have women in the tech industry, something that Anita seems to completely gloss over in her latest video, that her latest seminar that she held and allowed to be taped, much to my surprise, in which she, she just completely ignores these women. There's also the video, the Bayonetta video, which Anita has deleted from her channel. Hmm, I wonder why which has a character, Bayonetta, who is designed 
by a woman. Halo, arguably one of the big testosterone-filled macho male power fantasies, is in the hands of a woman. A woman who runs, by the way, 343 Studios. And thanks to Don Matrick stepping down, Xbox One, again, one of the go-to macho testosterone-filled male power fantasy enabling game consoles, is in the hands of a woman. And what's most disgusting about this is the fact that, especially in the Bayonetta video, which I wish I could show you, but Anita deleted it, is that Anita doesn't take any time whatsoever at acknowledging that Bayonetta was designed by a woman. Not only that, that, that this could be actually something that this woman wanted, that this woman portrayed in the way that she wanted to portray it as a character design, which then asks the biggest question of all. What is the point of being a a big shot female name in the tech industry, in the gaming industry, if you're just gonna be thrown under the bus like you were any other man out there who was subjugating women or making women look like they were fools or what have you. And I think that's one of the bigger insults here. It's that you can work your butt off as a woman. I mean, look at the look at the crap that the Yahoo CEO is getting for all the policies that she's putting in place and everything else. And now she's being thrown under the bus, even at times by other feminist blogs, as I've seen. And it's like, you sit there and you go and you say, oh, because of sexism, because of discrimination in the industry, women can't get ahead. But what are you doing? to foster a want for women to get ahead in the tech industry, when the moment any of them do anything that might even be remotely disagreeable to your delicate sensibilities, suddenly she's thrown under the bus. Suddenly, the fact that she's a woman no longer matters. Suddenly, you don't care about her gender. You just care about her perceived wrong that she has done to you. And sometimes you even spin it into some sort of perceived wrong against future girls and women. And then you dare to say that I, people like myself who are arguing with Anita are trying to foster the misogynistic status quo of the gaming industry? Is this a joke? But okay, okay, okay. Let's say that sexism really does dig deep and it really does hurt women and men. What do we do about this without just resorting to saying, well, it's here to stay, nothing we can do about it. There is something we can do about it. Even you critics of the critics of Anita Sarkeesian can do something about it. In the underbar is something known as the intersubjective consensus. In other words, in a way, it's how groupthink works, but on a social standard. It's a model that has emerged in recent times that says that it's not that politics informs societal behavior, it's that societal behaviors and societal belief systems actually foster political gains, political ideals out there. And that if you want to change politics, you have to tap into the intersubjective consensus. Now, it would take far too long to explain it here, but links are down in the underbar as to what the intersubjective consensus is and what power it holds. If you want to change sexist advertising, you want to change sexist games, barring artistic visions, which I will be talking about in Act 2 and in Act 3, then simply labeling something sexist and walking away from it saying, oh, the only people who could possibly defend this are misogynists. The only people who could possibly defend this are disgusting individuals who want the power to be able to discriminate against women and they're boo-hooing because they're losing that power because women are getting power. That's not I repeat, not the way to argue sexism. Not even a little bit. You'll get as far as the militant vegans, as far as the militant these uh, theists, as far as the militant atheists in terms of changing people's minds for the better. If you really want to exact change, if you really want to exact differences, you have to tap into that. Want more proof? How about Sweden? With the power of the intersubjective consensus changing people's minds, changing people's moods about stereotypes, about sexism, about all that, 
recently, as you can see here, you have a toy catalog that Sweden has put out for Christmas of last year, 2012, in which, as you just saw, girls were photographed playing with toy guns. And what they don't show here, and I wish they would, is that boys were playing with dolls. And nobody outside of Sweden, nobody outside of Sweden, was up in arms about this all that much. Nobody was really all that angry except for the fringe elements, and they're always going to be angry about this. Let's be very clear. But here, you can see very clear change. You can see very clear differences. Why? because the intersubjective consensus is saying, hey, this is okay. Girls can play with guns, boys can play with dolls. Also, though, to those who look down on media and say that there's no examples of good men writers who could write women or no good portrayals of women, I give to you. Author of Game of Thrones, which I'm sure people will still throw under the bus, so whatever. When asked by Upworthy why it shouldn't be difficult to write believable female characters, his answer was this. I've always considered women to be people. So tell me again about the systemic sexism. Tell me again there are no positive portrayals of people and that there aren't such things as men who can write effective good women characters and all this other stuff. That all we can do is muck things up. That all we can write are whores and prostitutes like Frank Miller does and not write women who are actually like real women. George R. R. Martin is Exhibit A against that. And the fact that men and women almost everywhere really like Game of Thrones, with certain little exceptions here and there, and there is the whole incest rapey thing, but I digress. The fact that he can write women that make people go, wow, this woman is three-dimensional. She actually is interesting. She's actually an integral part of the story instead of being wall hangings or a place for main characters to stick their dicks. Why isn't this more promoted? Why isn't this more a good example of how to write women. And why is it also glossed over that a lot of the games out there called sexist were written almost ex uh, directly by women, like Mass Effect 3, for instance. The point, though, as I end this section, is you can change the intersubjective consensus and get people engineering true social change, like in Sweden, but you have to work for it. The thing that pisses me off the most that I realized today while watching a Jim Sterling video that was loosely based around some of this subject was this. You've got people in the industry who make games and they say, I'm not going to apologize for my choice of gender of character. It's the gender's not what's important to me. It's the story. It's how the story works. And in this case, the story might fit a boy. But if you wrote it slightly different, it might embody a woman or a girl. You have all these people who are looking to the industry and they're saying, you have to change. You have to, you have to tear down this idealism. You have to foster our wants and our needs. And this goes into what I'll be talking a lot about in part two and three about art by committee that I don't like. But here's the thing. Team Meat is two guys. Two guys who spent years working on coding, working on levels, working on games. Games that they wanted that the industry wouldn't touch within a 10-foot pole. You want to sit here and stomp your feet and demand that change happens, and it change happens on your terms. And yet, what's stopping you from learning how to code? What's stopping you from learning how to write? What's stopping you from learning how to draw and use your skills to create concept art, to write games? Games. There's, if two guys, guys, emphasis on the word guys in this case, can make a game on their terms and get it onto, say, Xbox and PC, then what is your excuse, ladies? What is your excuse, women? Because this goes back to the whole talk about how some people say that women should grow a thicker skin online. Something I slightly agree with. Because otherwise, they're trying to portray themselves as strong, independent women while constantly asking for people to step in on their behalf and fight their battles for them at times. Never mind the frag dolls, which are linked down below, including a college humor video in which 
which the women ask the guy who's being clearly sexist to make them a sandwich. And not only that, they made two videos, and I'm even throwing in the Frag Dolls website, so that you can see that there are women online in the gaming community who not only take it, but they dish it right back out and don't take it so personally and demand that the industry and the people change to their taste to their whims. They're going into games like Call of Duty. They're going into games like Halo, stereotypically male-only gaming spaces, and they're kicking butt. And once again, do they get any kind of recognition from people like Anita? Any kind of recognition from critics of the critics of Anita? No, they don't. It's like they don't exist, which once again says, why be a high-profile female in gaming? Why be a high-profile female in tech industry if even the people who are saying that you should exist will throw you under the bus the moment you say or do anything that doesn't support their rhetoric? And you want to claim that it's only male domination, that it's male discrimination against women that are keeping them from the tech industry? Are you joking? To finish off this section in this thought, my point with Team Meat is this. Simply labeling something sexist without making the connections, like conjunction junction as it were, that when your your train cars aren't connected and they're going nowhere, and you demand, you demand that people either agree with you without proof or evidence, or they get out of the way, or that they're bad people, that they hurt women on their off hours, that they just want to support a system of systematically hurting and putting down women and depowering women without proving it. It's like handing in a piece of math homework, and you write 2 plus 2 equals 6, except you don't show your work, you don't explain yourself, and you only expect people to accept the answer as is. No. That's not how this works. You want change? Access the intersubjective consensus. It can be done. It is being done at times. And it means you have to work for it. Because when, when your critics are far more researched for free than you are, it means that they're doing far more work than you actually are putting into not just your talks, but your movement. And then you wonder why people might listen to your detractors more than they may be listening to you. When people actually prove their talking points, like everything I have linked down below to substantiate what is coming out of my mouth, when I actually cite sources, when I actually put materials for people to consider down in the underbar, even if it doesn't fully agree with me. I'm likely, more than likely, to at least have people consider my talking points and realize where they may or may not have gone wrong. And at least gets us talking about progression instead of stopping the talk to sit here and hash out objective factual detailing. Because otherwise, this is all for nothing. Otherwise, even starting this talk is for nothing, because what Anita's doing is she's playing the victim card even to this day. She's claiming that it's not that critics can disprove her, it's that we just don't like her because she's a woman. Because even to this day, she claims to be a feminist, which by, by Act 3, you'll understand that there is nothing feminist actually about Anita. There's more feminist in her partners, some of whom are male, ironic enough, than there is with Miss uh, Nita herself. And I'm supposed to believe that she deserves the title of the voice of feminism in game. That she deserves to be praised and heralded and that we should be trying to work towards her goals when she's done nothing, I repeat, nothing to really honestly substantiate any of her claims in the first three videos. And here I am. Here I've always been, putting links down in the underbars, making connections, breaking conflations, and replacing the connections with what properly matches up. And I'm being told that I'm not making a worthwhile contribution to any of this because I'm not willing to talk objectively about what sexism is sometimes. I've given you the definitions, but what you haven't given me is who all is affected, 
how they're affected, what are the positive effects of it, what are the negative effects, because we sit here and we try to say that sexism is always bad, it's always evil, that it can't be any kind of healthy expression of a sexual society, one that could benefit from being less uptight about what turns them on. And instead of talking about when it can be empowering and when it goes too far and hurts women, it's just, Oh, well, you never talk about what sexism is, therefore your points are invalid. Even though you have links and a wall of links, I'm not going to listen to what you have to say because you're just a troll. Oh, how progressive of you. But that's my thing. I don't mind what Anita was trying to do in terms of the abstract that she put out there. I object that she's done no work. She's done None of the actual legwork or research that she claims that she would be making. And I still argue with one of my links linked down below that no, her quality of her videos has not improved. But again, this would get into a subjective fight and I'm not in the mood to get into subjectivity here. But simply saying, this is sexist, it needs to change, and walking away and expecting us to accept the answer does nothing. It proves nothing. It does nothing to push the arguments forward and leaves us stagnant, leaves this conversation stagnant. And that's before we even get into any or all of the proof that what Anita is putting out here is a scam and has nothing to do with women and girls. The other thing to consider, the other thing to consider is if she is truly for the rights of women, if she's truly for the rights of girls and future women everywhere, then why are you steeped in slut shame? Read through her slut walk talk again, or her slut walk article once again, and realize that this kind of attitude of not empowering women who I might identify as sluts or be promiscuous continues to allow misogynistic people to create and foster an environment where it's impossible, hard if not impossible, for effective legislation against the rape of women, as well as men, but again, that'll be for another video some other time. She's fostering the kind of slut-shaming that says, if you've ever been promiscuous in your life, you can't be raped. Does that sound at all like a woman who is working towards the rights towards the end of things like sexual violence against women and the poor prosecution therein in the courts. When she condemns sex workers, when she condemns people who want to identify as sluts and not be talked about in, in assumptions. This is important, people, because if she is what she says she is, she's not very good at it. But if she is, as I am going to attempt to prove by the end of Act 3 that this is all a con, then well, good job. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, Miss Anita. Because once again, just like the talk about these women in tech play in high tech positions who constantly get thrown under the bus by people like Anita, or not acknowledged by people like Anita, to not acknowledge or to say, oh, I only care about you if you're a woman who acts and does and says the things that I agree with. If you're not, then I don't care about your rights. I don't care about your body autonomy. Oh, oh yes, but I'm the entitled gamer. I'm the entitled male, right, who is just speaking out against you because I want more breast physics in games. If I'm to take you at your face value, Anita, then the only way to rebut this is grow up. Anyways, this is the final end to Act 1. Hopefully we'll get into Act 2 where I talk about the backers of Anita as well as the audience, the broad um, spectrum of reactions of the audience and why all of us on many levels have it a bit wrong when going after Anita before finally getting into our dessert for the evening, which will be Act 3, where I will talk about any and all evidence that shows that Anita Sarkeesian is A, not an actual feminist, 
or does not evenly apply her feminism uh, to the things that she enjoys, the things that she cares about, and the things that she finds that subjugate women versus the things that the very same things that she claims doesn't subjugate women. That this was all for money and that there's enough of her past to try to show that her and parties around her that she's involved with, some of whom are co-credited in her, her Feminist Frequency series, by the way, are actually more likely to be the people supplying her with any and all feminist rhetoric and that most of the ideals that are being espoused are not Anita's own feelings, are not Anita's own expressions, which turns this entire talk about intellectual honesty, integrity, and being genuine into showing that she's dishonest, she's not just lied by omission, but she lies in general, and that she works with whatever she can not for the betterment of womankind at all, but for money. And that's before even getting into some of the other issues that I have with her series that will not be covered in this video, because this is mostly about the Tropes vs. Women in Gaming video series, but don't be surprised if small parts of what Anita brings up in her other series don't make their way into parts of this series as a matter of presentation about character, or in this case, Anita's lack thereof. Take care for now. Wow.